Today, we're diving into an important and often overlooked part of building a machine learning model, which is creating a model card. Model cards are essential for transparency and accountability of your model. We'll go through a few examples of model cards that make it extremely clear how these work and why they're so useful. And we'll go ahead and create one for ourselves using the model <laughs> using the model card toolkit in Python and some help from ChatGPT. I'm Alex, a data engineer and author of the Applied Data Science Workshop. I make videos for people who code. Today's video will be most interesting to data engineers, machine learning engineers, and data scientists. So let's start with the basics. What are model cards? They're well described by this research paper, Model Cards for Model Reporting. They're a standardized way to document essential information about machine learning models providing insights into how a model works, its intended use, its performance metrics, ethical considerations, and other things. This section of the paper outlines exactly what goes into a model card and the things you need to think about for each section, such as the model details, like the date it was created, what type of model it is, if it has a license, the intended use of that model, metrics such as its performance or decision thresholds, which data sets you use. Here's an example of a model card for smiling detection in images. The first thing I notice about this is on the right hand side, this is illustrating evaluation metrics documented in the metric section, such as the false positive rate and the false negative rate. So you can see how well the model performs on different segments of the population. In the intended use, you can see that they're saying it's not particularly intended for younger audiences. And in the factors section, they're indicating that gender, age, and race will affect the performance of this model. In the caveats and recommendations section, they're saying that further work could involve a whole spectrum of genders rather than just male or female like they've included. Here's another example of toxicity in text. In this case, they're trying to classify how much toxicity exists in given corpus of text. They're using a convolutional neural network and they have notes about who developed the network that they're using. They're illustrating the intended use case as a wide variety such as supporting human moderation and providing feedback to comment authors. However, they're noting it's not intended to make judgments about specific individuals. They're documenting their metric as AUC, which stands for area under the curve. And similar to the last model card, they're visualizing their metric on various subsets of the data. Unlike the previous model card, this one has a difference between the training data and the evaluation data, whereas before they used a standard train test split, in this case the evaluation data was synthetically generated, and they discuss that here. It's probably already obvious to you why these are so important, but let me go through a few specific reasons. One, they promote transparency. They help users understand how a model was developed, what data it was trained on, and its potential limitations. This transparency is crucial for building trust in machine learning predictions. Secondly, model cards support accountability in the way that these models were trained, evaluated, and are being used in production. When issues or biases arise, model cards can pinpoint the source of the problem and help guide improvements. They're essential for responsible machine learning development. Lastly, model cards can be used for regulatory compliance. In some industries like healthcare or finance, this is incredibly important. So now let's have a look at how we can create one of these for our model. We're gonna be using an example data set called the Boston data set from Scikit-Learn. And here we're trying to predict the value of houses based on various features about the house, such as how much square footage it has or how many rooms it has. This is a classic machine learning problem where we can use regression to predict the price of the house. Wow, I remember using the Boston housing data set way back when I was just getting started with machine learning. So this was like six or seven years ago. Well, now it's telling me that it's not even part of scikit-learn anymore. It's been removed because of racial self-segregation in the variable B, which relates directly to the percentage of the town that's black, basically saying that 
we are going to predict the price of your house depending on what race you are which is really bad for a model to do. Anytime that we have information about gender or races or religious um, affiliations being leaked into a data set, that's something we should pay attention to um, in how we're building our models because it's not fair to um, price somebody's house based on their race. It, it's suggesting that we could use the California housing data set. So this has created our model for us and ran it. We can talk about what it's doing step by step. So first it loads our data set. We can see this is like an object with data, a target, feature names, and description. Next it's loaded that into a data frame and a target. So looking at the description, I can see that the target variable is the median house value for California districts. And this is in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for example, 3.4 would be $340,000 rough. So next we've split our data into train and test sets, and then I've applied polynomial feature transformations. So if I look at x train poly, we can see that there's gonna be a lot of additional polynomial feature columns. So this is just gonna be one record. So we can see that it has 45 features now and those were created by taking the second degree polynomial. So what's happening is for each of these, we're looking at what that value is squared, so the self-interaction, but we're also looking at the interaction between the two. So when you take med inc and multiply that with house age, what do you get? Next, we're creating a linear regression model and we're fitting that and we find the mean squared error we get is 0.464. So what does that mean? Well, you're taking the average of a bunch of squared values. So the average error that we're seeing is around $70,000 on a house. Next, I wanna create a visualization of our metric for different subgroups, just like we're seeing in the model cards for model reporting paper. Let's break it down by AVE OCUP, which is the average number of household members. So we can see that this variable is continuous. So here we're just seeing the average occupancy for that whole area. So what I'm gonna do is just round this to the nearest integer. It looks like mp.round is gonna do that for me. Okay, great, so now I've got integer bins. So what I could do is look at the value counts. Okay, cool. So, um, so now I'm curious about for these different groups in here, how well our model performs in terms of accuracy. Cool. So now let's go ahead and create our model card. So I'm gonna copy and paste the model card guidelines from the paper, and I'm gonna say, create a model card for this model, referring to these guidelines. Be sure to ask me enough questions using the guidelines above. So now it has a bunch of questions that I have to go ahead and answer. The model details are fairly straightforward, like my name and a date, what type of model was used. The intended use is to predict house prices for realtors, and we should not be using it to remortgage homes or issue loans. The metric we're using is mean squared error. We're using polynomial feature extraction. I mentioned how we explored the mean squared error of different average occupancies and some ethical considerations like the fact that average occupancy might leak um, some data about ethnicity. I've also written some caveats and recommendations like the model selection was arbitrary, we didn't try any others aside from linear regression, and that we could do further feature engineering aside from just polynomial features. And also that regularization might help with overfitting or could provide some interesting insights on irrelevant features. So it's gone ahead and put out a model card and I'm gonna ask for this in markdown format. So it's gone ahead and done that with highlighting and indentation and links. And I can go ahead and just put that into our notebook to see what it looks like. Great, so ideally this can be automated. 
so that whenever we make a model update, it automatically updates the model card. Something that can help with this is the model card toolkit in Python, which can be used with scikit-learn. So let's see if we can get that running right now. I wanna bake all this information into code, right? Python code that does this using the model call card toolkit library. So first I'll go ahead and install it. I'm not able to install the model card toolkit on Mac OS. What I'm gonna do is use a Google Colab notebook. So I've loaded my notebook and I was able to install and import the model card toolkit but when I copied this code in from ChatGPT, it didn't work, which means ChatGPT gave us useless, hallucinated code. So let's try a different strategy. Here on the left, I've got an example notebook of how to use the model card toolkit. So what I'm gonna do is copy over a bunch of sample code for how this actually works. Use the model card toolkit, generate a generic model card. Here's an example of how to use the model card toolkit. We'll go ahead and grab that example and paste it in here. This code seems to be a lot closer. It seems like it might just work. It's not recognizing the data because we don't have any data in this new notebook that I fired up. So let's fix that now. Uh, we'll try this one again. You can see some generic information like the overview or a version ID which it's assigned. Unfortunately, we didn't have any success actually getting ChatGPT to code this for us with our specific data. So what you would have to do now is go through the markdown that we were able to generate and translate this into code. That way you could automatically cook this into your application. What would be really nice is to include this chart we generated for the performance of our model on different average occupancies inside of our model card. I can see in the example that there's a function plot to string, and we're gonna use that. I'll pass an MCT graphic, and I will point it to our image. Cool. So now we're including this image in our model card. So in conclusion, you've seen how model cards are a powerful tool for transparency, accountability, and compliance in the world of machine learning. By creating model cards, you help ensure that your models are well-documented and can be understood by others. It also helps you think about making sure your model is ethically sound. I'm curious if you've heard of model cards before and if you've used them in your models. If you found this interesting or informative, please give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing. As a new channel, it helps me get my content discovered. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.